I was working at a college of education in Roehampton when uh, I decided that it might possibly not be my thing to be in teaching for the next 50 years. And uh, I telephoned the BBC one day and asked for a job, literally just like that. But of course, in those days, they take on anybody. I joined, as everyone did then, uh, as a contract design assistant uh, for a three-month contract. There were about 120 designers. The department in total, of course, was costume, makeup, graphics, visual effects. So it must have run into the thousands, I would have thought, in, in four or five different buildings. We were all in what is now the design block, then called the scenery block, and the whole area from ground to the top was all design staff, mostly um, scenic design, graphics, and some visual effects. In those days, one tended to be allocated in, in early days to, to programmes. So you would go along, your name would go to producers and so on. Unless you were fairly well known. I wasn't that, that well known at that time. So I'd done a lot of drama, but hadn't actually met David. So I went along to meet David. He was a very large man, very jolly. You, you could imagine him running a wonderful pub for instance. And he said, do come in, sit down, you know. Um, and, and we chatted away and said, yes, he gave me a pile of scripts and uh, I came away. And he knew I lived in Windsor. So whenever he phoned me in the office, he'd say, hello, is that Windsor Castle? And I'd say, no, it's me and I'm in the servants' quarters. What do you want? <laughs> Roger was in the next door office, Roger Murray Leach, who designed the original uh, Lib Liberator. And because the department of their, at that time was laid out in mostly an open plan uh, design, one could move from room to room very easily. Um, and one walked up and saw this wonderful model that Roger had, and it was something called the Liberator, for something called Blake 7. <laughs> It was a three-sided set with additions, a very high set. It must have been about two or three metres high. It took up about a third of the studio. It's beautiful. It was very high rostra, which went up about a um, metre and a half, two metres at the back. So anyone coming into the set always had a walk-down staircase, which people like Paul Darrow and certain others loved, because it was always like doing a walk-down at the beginning of every scene. They weren't quite so happy going up because, of course, they were going up out of a set with their back to the camera. But they always love walking in. Hola, Gun. One of the directors wanted to make the, the actual control area very small so you could keep everybody in one shot. But the script demanded big seating areas and places for people to move around. The man hours involved in set design was very much an issue when it came to any area of set design. And we didn't have the man hours, especially for the first episode, to actually execute the sets we required. So that if you look at the first episode which was recorded, all I had was a painted backcloth which only required, let's say, 20 man hours to execute rather than the 100 man hours or 200 man hours that was actually required to construct that left hand side of the set. It gave them more time to build the scenery. There were a lot of components. Many of the bits were actually boxed because they were some, some of them were quite fragile. So it would all arrive in like, 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 like an IKEA building set. And they would put the walls up and then they'd add the screen in. Then they'd add the lights in the back of the screen, which were designed by visual effects. Then the individual chairs and the seats and the control panel would all be unpacked. I mean, they were actually packed very well and, and, and they didn't actually get much damage. So they would all be unpacked and added and the set took probably about a day and a bit because of course they were not only doing Liberator, they were doing maybe five other sets as well. So the set that would be an entire day set, it would be an overnight beforehand, a day set and then an overnight finish. So you come in the next day and the set ideally would be finished. If you look at the set, we, a lot of the elements in it are hexagonal. We wanted something that would just carry that vision right the way through. And it meant that when we got to other parts of the ship, we could always reuse the same elements to get from A to B. Well, we only had two corridors and two doors. <laughs> Maybe we had three doors, but you had to be running up and down the same corridor and bursting through the same doors, but from a different angle. <laughs> Thank you.
you never quite knew where you were coming from, where you were going. But it was a very expensive set for the time. I mean, we were told that we were in the most expensive set that the BBC had ever, had ever made. And it looked great on telly. It just, when you were in the studio, it looked slightly different. Seats on the Liberator, I think they were partially made, partially bought, so it was an adapted design, as far as I remember. And they were two shades of grey, light and charcoal grey and silver grey. And I luckily never had to sit on them. The artists, I gather, weren't that happy with them. They felt uh, it was like getting on and off a bicycle. I did have a sort of bicycle seat, which has played havoc with me ever since, with yeah, sure. prostate problems. Uh, but, uh, uh, yes, it had a ridge in it, and I was sort of sat like that. The seats were slightly different in that they were designed so that you stood and leant against them. We yeah. couldn't actually sit down, you had to lean your bum mm. against it, basically. Mm. Check. Compensate for orbital drift and hold. I had a, a very sort of smart console with my forward boosters. <laughs> Three, two, one. The controls were based on the arms of angle poise lamps, which looked wonderful, I thought, first time round. They looked good. Uh, the whole set looked wonderful and had tremendous visual appeal to production who liked it and, and to the audience. As time went by, series sets would sometimes be refurbished because as obviously the set's going in and out every week. It got a lot of knockings. <laughs> Sets were were um, left in the ring road um, week on week out, and then hauled back in. And by the time they'd been pulled around by half a dozen teddies and the little trucks, um, they they got smashed to pieces. What about the uh, automatic repair system? Oh, it'll do the job. You would arrange for a, a partial refurbish to be done as the set was going up. <laughs> That is fantastic. Repairs to the primary power channel are complete. I approached it um, like a kind of outing, like a sort of fun outing, and I was really going to enjoy this. It was going to be great fun. There wasn't enough money, and it could well be that because there wasn't enough money, invention was the mother of necessity. So finding yourself with maybe two or three very large sets to do, which, which might, in, in, in terms of actors, there might be 20 or 30 extras, perhaps. So the set is therefore defined by a certain size to get the actors in, to get the cameras, lights, and so on. Um, but nevertheless, there wasn't actually a huge amount of money. So I tended to resort to doing part set, part drape, part set, part drape. So I would make the good bits and spend some money on them. And then the gaps would, would be drapes or slash curtains. What are all these coloured ribbons? Perhaps they were having a party. I did tend to use a lot of drapes because drapes were much cheaper. You could actually have an area of drapes for a lot less money than you can have an area of set. The script gambit arrived on my desk and again, like many of the scripts, which are a very good script, it did ask for more than actually we had money for. So again, it was occasion, an occasion where a lot of drapes and, and part sets were necessary. Friends and patrons, your attention, please. I have an important announcement. I had seen um, a circus tent go up um, driving home from, because I live near Windsor and Chipperfield's winter quarters used to be near where I lived. And they were putting up part of a tent. And when it, they got the sides up and then the, 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 part, the, the, the upper part, which would then make a gable, was hanging into the area and then went up on a hoist, which was outside. And I thought, well, we could actually, that might well be right for Gambit. So I did a quick drawing and made, we often make small models of what it might be like. Went along a production meeting and suggested this is like a tent, only it couldn't be a whole tent because there wasn't enough money. And I just made strips of material to represent the walls. So they'd come up to about a metre and a half, perhaps two metres. And then the top part of the tent would actually dip into the set and then go up out of shot. And to reveal the artist who would then become our master of ceremonies, the 
material which surrounded her was a material called Slash Curtain, used very much on top of the pops in the 60s and 70s. I remember picking up the script and saying to the producer, you know, are we approaching this very much as, as a piece of theatre rather than a piece of high-tech telly? The high-tech telly we're doing anyway, you know, we know all about that. But really what we're doing is circus theatre, and we should treat it in that way. And, and that's the way it was played. It was played almost to the gallery. Vila, this gallant sporting gentleman, has agreed to end the evening with one final wager. It was very much a theatrical thing. It was quite a large set, and again, there wasn't a huge amount of money. It was a sort of Prince Regent, a kind of forerunner to a Blackadder character, one realizes now. Princely stripes, very much a stripey setup. Silver makeup, in fact, which was also used during the, the period of Prince Regent, the early 1800s. My designer tells me that it is patterned upon the attire of someone called the Prince Regent. Oh, what a pity that everybody doesn't enter into the spirit of carnival of Mardi Gras as wholeheartedly as you and I. <laughs> it was all very camp but enormously enjoyable. What's going on? What am I doing here? Fila, the flute offers you the white pieces and the advantage of the first move. That drink, I've been tricked. It was probably an episode that we laughed more on, and goodness knows we spent our time on, on Blake laughing a lot. <laughs> it inevitably happened that if you were doing Blake 7, you might well do all the filming for maybe three or four episodes. Uh, whilst the designer was actually doing the set, or, or maybe two designers were getting their, their sets ready for an episode that might not be for a few months. So we would, I would maybe go out and do the film location work, recce locations, find them and so on, build the sets, take them out, set them up, while somebody else was doing their own thing in the studio. We were always in clay pits. It was always February. Even in August, it was always February. It was always cold, and there were always explosions. And there was one dr terrible location um, at a pit with that large door that's sliding backwards and forwards, and the artist ran in and out continuously all day. I was in a Range Rover posh-looking Range Rover. So my car was actually very close to where the camera was because I could drive there. No, I think not many other people had a, a four-wheel drive at that point. So I drove the car quite close, and I was sitting in the driving seat writing the prop list for my next location. So I was sitting in the car, and along comes David Maloney, knocks on the window, you know, usual, go away, leave me alone. This is the producer. So I wound the window. I said, what do you want? He said, can I come in? <laughs> he was blue with <laughs> go. I said, well, yeah, but don't make a mess. So he got in the back, immediately took over the back of the car. It was his office for the rest of the shoot. And I said, David, it's so cold out there. You know, I can barely, I've got to go out in about five minutes and do something. I can barely go out. He said, yes, it's like, it's like Dunkirk, isn't it? On Harvest of Kairos, we had a length of fence, which I think then appeared in several other episodes. Obviously, someone liked the fence, and someone had to climb over it. Stuart fell, the stuntman climbed over and fell off, and that kind of thing. They're getting into this very, very little tiny set, and we needed them to walk up into shot, away from camera, and then down into the module. And we built the module and other bits, but there was nothing else left. I mean, it was a case of bring something from home and see what we can do. So. We, we put the camera along a piece of rostra, we, uh, along which we put, I think, some, some uh, what you call fablon. It's in the BBC terms, it's called martac. So we martac the top of a piece of rostra. We borrowed the ladder from another set, and the chippy lashed it to the rostra. And then, because there was nothing else, no money, um, I just got some empty cylinders, which were, I think, dark green with yellow tops. And I just put a line of them each side of the camera. And as the artist walked up into the frame, then he just walked away, and that was the set. On a later sequence, we had a large spider. 
it must have been at least a couple of metres in, in diameter. It was quite large, quite low. And the special effects team were very proud of this spider. They'd worked really hard on it. And Jim Francis uh, and the other visual effects designer, they were sort of all over this large red thing that, that was about as frightening as the light stand. I think she means you. And it was really unfortunate that the instant they trundled him out, the rest of the crew fell about laughing. It, it was very, very funny. I mean, none of us dare laugh, because, of course, you wouldn't laugh at another a designer's work. But uh, it wasn't really very frightening. He really didn't have the dramatic impact he should have had. We were doing a sequence again. It was rather theatrical, so it lent itself to a bit of a scene. We had a lot of drapes. On that episode, we were doing with Fiona Cummings, the director. But Fiona wanted a very, very wide shot, which meant that we'd have to build a set maybe three or four metres high, which was impractical, even for Ealing. So uh, we built the set as high as we could in terms of money and in terms of practicality. So what we did to make this, create the ceiling was use a glass shot. Nowadays, of course, you do it on post-production on computer. At that point, of course, it wasn't that advanced. So if you wanted to put a ceiling onto a set where you couldn't have a ceiling, because, of course, the, a lot of it was top lit. We've done it! We've done it! I've done it! You would pre-design it, of course. The artist would come paint on glass, so you'd have a locked-off camera, he'd paint the set, paint the ceiling on, and then you would cut to that shot as and when you wished. It was late in the day. It must have been six or seven in the evening. My assistant, Joe Page, and I had been there all day dressing most of the other sets. We finally got on to this, the black-and-white set, and it was, it was almost a complete circle. And I was up the ladder, finishing off some, some bits and pieces. Julie went out to buy some coffee in one of the tea bars. And I, I heard the door go. In a sound stage, when the door goes, it, 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 it's unmistakable. It's a huge bang noise. And, I, and it's a wooden floor, as Ealing was, and, and most film studios are. So I heard the clatter of feet across the floor, and I thought Julie would come round the, the, the set, and I, I'd look back and see her. Well, she wasn't there. So I heard the door bang again, and, and feet come across the floor, and I said, she, then she had the coffee, and I said, Julie, did you just come in a moment ago? And she said, no, this is the first time I've come in. And at that precise moment, um, I looked up to my left, and the gantry... Which, which was the means by which the electricians got from one side of the studio to the other off the ground, and they hung lights from it and so on. The gantry was just above my, my left eye, and a lady in a long grey, blue-grey coat walked from, as it were, camera right to camera left. She walked over the gantry and then just appeared, disappeared into the blackness. What the hell? I saw something. There was a slight smell of perfume. Very, very slight trace of perfume. That wasn't Jilly because she was a long way away from me. And I said to her, did you see that? And she was doing the coffee and I, she said, what? And I said, the lady on the gantry. She said, Ken, we're alone in the studio. Everyone else went hours ago and we should have gone too, by the way. We're alone. There's nobody else here. And I said, it was the Ealing Ghost. Rumours of Death shared with Paul Munting, the other designer. Paul did studio sets, I did location and location sets. Well, Rumours of Death, the, the house that was used was a private property and they were very keen that it was never revealed where the location was. In fact, I don't think I know to this day where the location was. I just went along with, on the coach with everybody else. Shot at Cornbury Park, which is sort of the back gate of Blenheim Palace, so Blenheim was their neighbour. A very beautiful country house owned, owned by Lord Rodwick. Um, and we were there sort of midweek to the weekend. So Friday night, um, I had to clear the hall and one or two other areas because they had a shoot coming. We, as you appreciate, were the BBC shoot, and what he had coming was a pheasant shoot. So Friday night, we did a big clean-up and, and, and tidied our things away into a, a side room. Come Saturday morning, very crack of dawn, we all arrive, 
outside the house and the shoot, the fashion shoot, also arrive outside the house. So there's a great car park jam and and everyone gets out of their cars and starts talking. Oh, who are you? Who are you? I'm so so I'm BBC. I'm I'm you know, Marcus of Tavistock and he was there with his wife. And oh gosh, love love wonderful car. That kind of thing. So we were all asking what each other did and the conversation eventually a loud whistle went. A production manager standing on a small wall shouts with a loud hailer, Would everyone who is here to shoot Blake Seppin please stand to the left? And everyone who is here to shoot Pheasant please stand to the right. We got the cars sorted out and we actually cleared the car park. At lunchtime, they they came back from the shoot and they were actually having a, a sort of buffet lunch and we were, our caterers were very close by. So we all got mixed up again, you see. Um, so we were discussing lunches by then and what we'd all been doing in the morning. It was great fun because they, they, they were fascinated by what we were doing. You know, they had no idea, you know, that... that as, as everyone says, I had no idea there was so much involved, you know. I didn't know you had to do all this, you know. I suppose they thought you just walked along and found the liberator on the street corner, you know. I asked Lord Rotherwick's butler if we could use the dining room. The dining room was very beautiful, it, it's Georgian. We used their table. Now, Lord Rotherwick always has his lunch in the dining room on one end of the dining room every day. So I said to the butler, you know, can I use the table? He said, yes, of course. I said, well, what would his lordship do? I said, well, he'd go somewhere else. So I went and found his lordship in the library, and I said, I hope you don't mind if I dress the table. We, we, we will make something. And he said, no, no I'll, I'll just have it on a side table. And I think he had lunch on a card table. It was rather sad. So it took us about four and a half hours with one of the prop boys and myself laying a table. And the butler was most complimentary, and he said, you're taking enormous care doing this, which is very much his thing, of course. And I said, I feel as though I'm being scrutinised, you know, because I'm actually dressing a table for a dinner for 14, which is what you do every day of the week, and I feel you're... But he was very, very charming. He didn't actually say anything. He just said it was very nice at the end, you know. Excellent. Assassin. <laughs> it was sort of Arabian Nights, um, very camp. Just the inside of a, a tent and the exterior, all the shots were exterior, and the anything beyond the set was meant to be Arabia, Lawrence of Arabia type thing. Valeria of Prin bids 100 vems. 100, that's very good, but you're going to have to do better than that. I had met the artist at the read-through and thought, I... I Got to talk to Betty Marsden. I've got to talk to Betty Marsden. I am a public servant. <laughs> Anyone of my generation had heard Betty on radio night after night and the, the wonderful things. She'd all seen her on, on movies. And uh, we, we sort of captured her at lunchtime and, and had lunch with her. And, you know, you, you would say things like, you know, uh, can you do the voice from round the horn or can, can you, what about what, working with Kenneth Williams or whatever? And she would very easily slip into character um, and she and Jackie really hit it off tremendously. <laughs> You're obviously fulfilling a deeply felt need, Bellis. Oh, yes, I am, yes, I am. Sand, um, another episode, again, which I shared with uh, a fellow designer, Eric Wormsley, um, I did the location work and the Ealing work, and Eric did the studios back at Television Centre. Um, most of the Ealing area was something like stage two to be covered in uh, green sand. Naturally, on Blake 7, you're not going to land on an ordinary planet, are you, Brighton Beach? You're going to land on a planet that's green. There, were all, there seemed to be huge discussions which went on for weeks about the actual... Um, way we were going to get a whole planet covered in this green sand, which was immensely expensive, um, because I can't remember how many pounds it was per bag, but we had to um, create a whole planet which was covered in this stuff, and it also had to move and creep and gradually build up over the windows of the set. And everyone looked green, so <laughs> it was constant hassle for lighting and makeup because the reflections coming off the colours that we had in the studio. There is supposed to be some form of life here, isn't there? Well, if there is, it probably won't like fires. So make one. It was OK a little bit, because I mean, if you're on a green planet, you can have a green shadow, perhaps, but they, they tended to look pretty grim in some of the takes, so they were dying. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 
We don't only carry passengers on this ship. We have a small hold and we carry cargo. Valuable cargo. Now, can anyone guess what it is? Go. Right first time. Gold was um, a sort of pleasure ship. Good morning, good morning. Keeler the person speaking. Inevitably running up and down corridors. They spent their lives running up and down corridors. So we'd, we had the main set in hand, which I'd borrowed from some another episode. We'd refurbished it, we'd added new props. As I say, we sometimes spent a lot of money on the foreground bits and used other bits of set, which is why sometimes, if you look, you see the same shapes, a different colour. But the corridor bits were literally no money at all. We just had enough money to make the basic corridor. The walls were just wheeled in with the inevitable sliding door. And uh, Francis, the buyer, and I went out to a wholesaler and we bought a load of, you know, when you're on, on an airline and you, you have your tray. So you have the basic tray, which might be grey plastic, and then on it you'll have a module of shapes in which you have the meat there and the veg there and what have you. So those plastic things are made by a company and we, we found the company, went along, we just bought millions of them, mostly in white, some in silver. So they were those trays, we turned them upside down and I just stapled them onto the set that morning and when the director came, he said, that's nice. <laughs> Basically, it was old set and uh, a bit of British Airways. Plastic. I tensile plastic. Orbit was the last one I did, because after that I went on to another drama series, Serial. Ken Legend, the designer, was amazingly creative, because we had two major sets to do... Uh, well, three major sets. We had the spaceship for Keeler's spaceship. And this is Keeler, your purser, welcoming you to Space Business. We had Egrorian's camp. With this wonderful dome feel about it. It's a wonderful set, that, actually, if you look at it. It's a little one where Servalan was hiding. A shuttle has just separated from Scorpio. Good. I'll be watching on the monitor when they arrive. But that was just a tiny one. That's probably just two flats. Knowing Ken, I mean, he could do anything with uh, egg boxes and things. And then, of course, we had the, the shuttle itself, which was quite a major set. And he did a fantastic job of that. He didn't waste much time ditching us, did he? <laughs> Places where Villa could hide, little air ducts and things. And I do believe he did use the egg boxes in that one. I really think he did. But it looked fantastic. He was a master of uh, how can I make something for 2P? I have to say my approach to the Beeb and designing anyway was, is, still is, if I'm not going to enjoy it, I'm not going to do it. You know, and if it isn't going to, if we're not going to have a lot of laughs, what is the point? <laughs> <laughs> Viel Lorimer at that time was a director, uh, mostly in BBC drama series serials. So this particular episode I was doing with Viel, his production manager, as would now be his first, was a guy called Geoffrey Manton. Geoffrey is a very tall, very BBC gentleman with a very proper English voice, uh, rather rather loud, or c commanding character. All right, we will go from the grower. Thank you, yes. thank you. Go That's from the grower. Let's envision from 138. So on the floor, Geoffrey was uh, getting the cast together and uh, wicked Jackie Pierce. President Serverland, we are indeed most honoured. She knew that if she asked Geoffrey certain questions, it wasn't just a yes or no. It would be the whole answer. And we'd all be there all night. So um, she had her phaser gun and, and, and so on and her bleeper or whatever. And um, she, he said, well, ra just round here, Jackie, you see. And then he, he walked off the set and the camera followed him. And all the cast followed Geoffrey, you see. And round here, you see, uh, Jackie, this is where Ken's done, you know, the sliding door mechanism is here. And, and the cast went round the back of the set. And, and we were all, this, this isn't happening, you know. And, and, and the camera panned over an empty set. The camera went round with them. 
And he said, and he, he described the whole of the back of the set, the construction, the rostra here, and there's a little offstage tread there. Oh, there's the button there. That's the other part of the button you press, uh, Jackie. And they were convulsing, walking behind him. And we're, 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 we're open-mouthed in the gallery because we're looking at an empty set. The artists are now walking. They're now almost at the end of the set, and they come on the other side. And by this time, the cat, the whole studio is almost on the floor laughing. And Jeffrey has explained the complete construction of the back of the set. And here we are now at the other side. They walk onto the set, and Jackie has to go and sit down. She's helpless. Open the cage, Mama. <laughs> Blake Seppen was a laugh all the time. Just the cast, just working with the cast, was enormous fun. <laughs> <laughs>